Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Ethan, for that blurb. Uh, if you'd like to follow along, you can go to regal.org slash talk. The slides are online. And I really appreciate that blurb. And actually, the book is now available on Amazon. I think you can buy it. And there's al already been a review, and I'm fascinated by online reviews. And I thought this one was quite interesting. Oh, that's not working. Oh, here we go. In that, this is the first review in the book. Regal knows the subject and sprinkles enough curse words throughout his book to make it NSFW if you were going to read it aloud. <laughs> I'm not going to be reading it, but I'm going to be talking about it. And the reason this chagrin and amuses me is, well, hopefully that's not the greatest contribution this book <laughs> to have has, is that I have a lot of curse words in it. But this book very much was inspired by WTF moments, right? What the frack, as they say on Battlestar Galactica, uh, or I might say, what, what the heck? And of all the moments that really inspired this book, I want to show you a clip of a video that really made me think, what the heck is going on here? Question. People tell me this all the time, so... I don't know. Is it true? People say I'm ugly. So, tell me. Am I? So seeing teens going on YouTube, one of the places where the commenting culture is understood as being the worst, asking YouTube commenters, am I ugly? This just blew my mind. And I was like, what the heck is going on? And again, this book, I had a lot of experiences in moments like that, which then inspired me to say, I want to try to figure out if I can understand what's going on. And when I saw this, I used to work with Tim Berners-Lee, the guy that invented the web. I worked at the World Wide Web Consortium. And I don't think that was Tim's intention or our intention, that this was what the web was going to be. But when I began thinking about it a little bit more historically, I ended up surprising myself. Because if I thought back in time, I've been on the web since 93, 94, since it was first created. But when friends and family started talking about the web back in, say, 2000, this is what they were talking about, this site, hot or not. This is how the web came to popular attention for a lot of people who weren't like computer science students like myself. And this was a site where you could upload a picture of yourself and people could click, am I hot or am I not? And so it seems actually the web's really good at this sort of stuff, as are social networks. Pe perhaps people know that Facebook actually began as a site called FaceMash. Zuckerberg was a student at Harvard. Harvard had have, have dormitories and houses where students live. And they have directories there with students' names and pictures called Facebooks. And so he went online, he wrote a scraper, he purloined the photos of Harvard students, pulled them into a website application called FaceMash, so him and his fellow male geeks could click on whether the women were hot or not, right? And so it seems both the web and a lot of the social media platforms out there are really well suited to this sort of thing. And in fact, one of YouTube's founders said he created YouTube in part via inspiration of Hot or Not. Jawid Karim said this was the site where it first occurred to him that people would be able to upload content. It was user-generated content. But it was more than that people were just uploading pictures of themselves. It was that other people were able to rate and comment on the content that other people were uploading. So it had the user-generated con content and the user's comment upon it. And so I think to understand the web as it exists today, we really do need to understand comment. But that raises the question of well, what is comment? So it's reactive. <laughs> I don't know if that'll mute. It'll mute the visual. I can turn it down if you'd like. Yeah, that's it. That's all the, that's all the sound. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when YouTube extended the period of video clips you could post on YouTube a couple of years ago, they said you can have 10 hour long video clips. And I don't know how many people have made use of 10 hour video clips, but the things that do exist up there are these sound loop clips. And actually I wrote a lot of this book listening to Darth Vader breathing. I found it kind of soothing. Um, 
And under, you know, under that YouTube video, you find someone leaving the comment, what am I doing with my life, 10 hours of breathing? So comments are reactive. They're in response to something, though they're not always response of, right? We know that expression, TLTR, too long, didn't read. So they are reactive, but not necessarily substantively responsive. They're also short. <coughs> I include plus ones and likes as within the purview of comment. Uh, maybe a couple paragraphs, perhaps a couple sentences, no more than a paragraph or two. They're asynchronous, so you might get a response back from someone immediately or in an hour or in a day. But you might quibble with any of those sort of definitions. Is it 140 characters? Is it 12 words? And I will admit that my criteria, my attributes are a little bit loosey-goosey. But the essence of what I'm talking about is best captured in a number of tweets from a developer, Shane Lisgan, who had this wonderful Twitter account called Avoid Comments. And he had about 100 tweets on there just talking about comments are so horrible, you're best avoiding them. <coughs> and he wrote, there's a reason that comments are at the bottom of the internet. I say web for a particular reason that I won't get into. You know, it's, they're, they're terrible. And they b deserve to be at the bottom. So when I started this book, I was like, well, what could we learn, given all these WTF moments, in sifting through the comments? And I think we can learn things about ourselves and about how others seek to exploit our, our social selves. And so I've read the comments so you don't have to, right? I took an expedition to the bottom of the web. I explored uh, various places. I visited various communities, including Amazon reviewers, mean kids, uh, different commenting communities that uh, live under other people's posts, including free thinkers, scammers, fakers, makers, takers, lots of different sort of places I went to. And so our mission for today is to consider four different questions. I call them the mysteries of comment. Why do people abandon comment platforms? Why are comments often so awful? Can we trust the comments at the bottom of the web? And a reprise of WTF. So let's talk about the migration, the boom and the bust. One of the questions I like to ask my students is, uh, we've had lots of different messaging and platform content. Uh, is it over? And I want to engage this topic by way of a story about Trent Reznor. Has anyone ever heard of Trent Reznor? <laughs> Maybe half, not everyone, right? But he's the front man of a band I like, Nine Inch Nails, that's known for a very sort of angry, industrial kind of sound. And he stumbled upon Twitter in about 2009, and he was tickled pink, uh, to characterize him in a weird way, because he can see he's kind of angry looking here. And he said, I went on Twitter, and I realized I was able to to express myself a little more authentically. I was able to let down the curtain. Um, but he didn't stay for long. He said, I'm leaving because um, idiots rule. And so what prompted him to so quickly engage and then leave Twitter? And I think his example is demonstrative for a lot of people. And not only have people abandoned various messaging platforms, but platforms themselves and websites have experimented with turning comments off or trying to fix comments. And so I've noticed various migrations. We started out in GeoCities. We had MySpace. We had Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google+, Instagram, Snapchat. Amongst people who like to comment on geek news sites, uh, I started out on Slashdot, and I followed Dig, and I still follow a little bit of Reddit, and I probably spend more of my time on Hacker News. So again, why are we sort of always migrating like a massive bison? So I think this is part of the reason why. At its start, Twitter felt edgy and intimate. I knew a lot of people when Twitter came online that were quite pleased because they had a chance encounter with a celebrity. Someone retweeted them or someone spoke to them on Twitter and they were just you know, really pleased with the idea. Similarly, celebrities, famous <coughs> people, this was a space where they could actually lower the cart curtain, as Trent Reznor said. And so a lot of people were getting something out of this experience when it was relatively small. And in fact, it's not surprising. People like talking about themselves. Communication theorists know that when we are shooting sort of the shit informally, we spend 30 to 40% of our time on gossip. And researchers have found that this is still the case on Twitter today. And in fact, for a long time, gossip was kind of looked down upon among people who study communications. And actually, an evolutionary theorist 
uh, ended up changing that in that Robin Dunbar had asked this question of himself, why is it that primates and humans in particular have such big brains? And he ended up arguing it's gossip that actually is the most important thing. And the reason he made that argument is he looked at lots of variables and tried to figure out, figure out what correlates with brain size in an animal's environment. And it wasn't what they ate. It wasn't how they look, moved around. It actually correlated with how much time they spent in groups. Group size, the one measure of social complexity available to me at the time, did correlate with neocortex size. So among monkeys, for instance, and chimps, they spend time picking the fleas off of one another's backs, right? And we know that they use this to form alliances. And if one monkey is attacked by another monkey, a friend is likely to come in and defend that monkey based on how recently they groomed one another. And Dunbar argued humans do the same sort of thing, but we've grown, out, grown outside the bounds of picking fleas off of one another's backs. Instead, we talk about one another. We gossip about one another. And one of the key insights here for comments are that there's a certain scale to the, to the number of people whom fleas you can pick off of. Similarly, there's a scale to the, to the number of people you can kind of gossip about. And Dunmore put that number at 150 people. Those are the people that you know fairly well, such that not only do I know my friends, but I know the friends of my friends. And if the friend of my friend is my enemy, or my enemy of my friend is my friend, so 150 people is that what he calls a clan. It's that small group of people that you have some sense of what their secondary uh, relationships are like. And at some point, though on Facebook, we probably have more friends than 150 people. But at some point, we will reach that stage in online commenting platforms where you go beyond that scale, where you start asking, who brought that guy? And you start getting hit by spam and scammers, and you realize this place isn't, funny, isn't fun anymore. And I think that's what's happened on Twitter and so many other sort of places. And what I call this is intimate serendipity. I think we're looking for a way to express an authentic sense of ourselves, because we like to gossip, we like to self-disclose, without feeling that we're getting harassed or stalked or getting undue scrutiny. Um, while remaining open to things that will surprise and delight us. When I go on Facebook, for instance, I don't find very much of interest there. Maybe that's my friend's fault. Uh, but most of it is what you would expect, kind of various memes and tropes and advertisements that I don't really sort of care for. And what has happened is when you're on a platform, that intimate serendipity turns to what Reznor called sludge. When he went on Twitter, he already had a forum on his website, nineinch.nails.com, N-I-N.com. But there were a group of fans, I don't know if you would call them fans, who would basically harass him and hate on him all the time. And Twitter was a breath of fresh air for him because they had not yet found him. And the thing that chased him off Twitter is the metal contingency had succeeded. And I love to quote Tresner because he's so mean. It depresses me to think my art and life's work can attract this kind of scum. You trolling, cowardly pigs, you succeeded. And that was his flounce. He left. But lots of people have disabled comments or stepped away from comments in a less sort of vicious way, perhaps. Uh, Boing Boing has long struggled with comments. For a little while, they experimented with disemvoweling. When I first saw this, I was quite tickled. They basically, if you post a comment, that they think is inappropriate, they would remove all the vowels from your words. And the idea was that would, that would make you upset or angry and school you a little bit. Um, it only lasted for a year. And research actually seems to indicate that schooling people and downvoting people for inappropriate behavior actually often prompts them to act out even worse. And it's contagious within the community, because then people act even jerky, and then other people act jerky. And it's not necessarily a good thing. But other sites like Washington Post and Gadget and Popular Science have all turned their comments off for periods or forever. And I think this is most ironic because Dave Weiner can be said to be one of the foundational people in the blogging space. And he is at least a one of two people who can be said to be the first person to have enabled comments on his blog. We, now I'll take this for granted, but there was a time when this was a new sort of thing. And he has a bit of a contentious personality. He gets in controversies. But eventually, he just said, I'm turning off the comments. And so I find this very telling that the person who first had comments on his blog ended up turning it off altogether. And so this is basically how I conceive of that migration, 
we're all looking for intimate serendipity. We're confronted by the metal sludge and ads, which I'm going to come back to in a little bit. And the sites will try to create filters and fortifications and moderation and meta moderation and all these sort of schemes to deal with the sludge and the spam and the ads. But eventually, people will migrate and look and search for something else. So I now think about this uh, Twitter. There was just news in the past <coughs> week or two that Twitter still hasn't managed to make a profit. And everyone's wondering when that other shoe is going to drop. Are they going to start putting ads in people's Twitter streams? Are they going to start shaping, which is alleged supposedly, what you see? Because right now, you see everything that your friends post, whereas in Facebook, they shape what you see. Twitter might start shaping what you see and taking money from other people to shape what you see. It's going to have to happen eventually. They're going to have to make a profit if they want to succeed. And then lots of people will probably move on. So let's turn to this question of well, why, where does the metal sledge come from? Why are people just so awful online? And I want to introduce this topic by way of a story of Kathy Sierra. Kathy Sierra is an author. She wrote a really a number of good books about Java she, under the O'Reilly publisher. She's a popular blogger. She had a very uh, well-read, widely read blog. And she's a speaker. She would talk at lots of different co conferences. She also did two things that made her a target to alienation. Uh, one, the second one, is just that she's just a woman. It's not like she did anything there. But that brought an undue amount of alienation and hate upon her. And a long time ago, before we knew better, she actually said bloggers should be able to delete in inappropriate comments from their site. That's all she did. But a lot of horrible things happened. And in 2007, she posted something on her blog saying, I'm scheduled to speak at a conference, but I'm at home, the doors lock, and I'm terrified. And she said, as a public person that lives online, like anyone, She's received her share of snarky comments and uh, people being mean. But it had reached a new sort of level. And she basically disappeared for the, from the web for at least five years. And why? Why does this sort of stuff happen? I want to keep it simple, because people have been studying this for almost two or three decades now when I talk about sort of the theoretical background. I think there's two sets of theories that explain why people are awful online. The first is good people acting badly. And the second, which uh, I'll say a bit more too, is that bad people acting out. <coughs> so if we look at that Kathy Sierra case, at the good people acting badly, what had prompted the harassment of Kathy Sierra was a blog by the, gnome, a blog by the name of Mean Kids. It was set up by Christopher Locke and a couple of his colleagues. And you can't read the subtitle here, but it says, this is a book he's published, The Bombast Transcripts, Rants and Screeds of Rage Boy. So his online pseudonym was Rage Boy. And he liked to you know, take people down. And he wasn't harassing them. He wasn't hating on them. But for instance, he had called Kathy Sierra a hopeless dipshit. And you could say, well, is that appropriate, inappropriate? It wasn't hateful, it wasn't illegal, but you had people out there, perhaps, who were actually decent people if you made, met them face to face, but saying things like this online. And in this really weird, surreal turn of events, Christopher Locke did meet Kathy Sierra face to face in a live segment on CNN um, to try to work out their differences, which is, I think was absurd and obscene. But some of the social theories apply to all of this. I classify into two groups. We have the media theories. And so starting in the 90s, people began looking at issues of what is it about online <laughs> computer-mediated communications that prompt this sort of behavior. And there were a number of theories that I won't get into too much right now. And then we also had various uh, behavioral theories. And so some of the ideas are that when we're online, we lose some of our inhibitions. Uh, we lose some of our norms. Or we don't lose all our norms altogether, but we look to a more salient group of people or community to say, this is what's appropriate for me to do or what not to do. And then there's theories of moral disengagement. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. And so I'm not going to dig into it. This isn't a literature review. But those are some of the social theories that people have offered. But there's also more popular theories, which I think are really fun. Uh, this is a comic from one of my favorite online comics, Geek and Poke, that's available under a Creative Commons license, so I could use them in the book. I was happy about. But this says the history of social 
1985, being a troll was not as much fun. Someone with a bag on the head yelling asshole at someone else. We also had Gollum, right? The whole story of the Lord of the Rings is you have this powerful ring that renders you invisible and gives you other sort of powers. <coughs> and even the modest and virtuous hobbits, they were the only people that could hold on to it for a little bit of while, but eventually even they would be corrupted. Gollum was corrupted, and even Frodo was corrupted in the end. If you remember, he's in the volcano. Gollum, Frodo doesn't want to give up the ring. Gollum bites it off, and he falls into the lava, and that's how the ring is distorted. But Frodo had actually become corrupted too. And we could even go further back than that. The story uh, that Plato tells in the Republic about Gyges uh, started out as an honest shepherd, found a ring of invisibility, used its power to kill the king, bed his wife, and take over the kingdom. Not a very kind uh, statement on where King Gyges came from, but again, it speaks to this question of, can we be virtuous in the online context when we lack accountability? Most popularly and most recently, this is sometimes referred to as the internet fuckwad theory which is if you take a normal person, you add anonymity in an audience, they will act awfully. So that's the take on why people do awful things. If we assume that they're relatively normal people, that would probably treat you decently if you met them face to face. But there's another set of people that I think are worth considering too, and that's bad people acting out. To the extent, and it's not a clear line, that we can say some people are bad or disordered or scary, they too are online. So the harassment against Kathy Sierra really sort of took up uh, a lot of speed when this guy Weave got involved. And for a while, I long wondered, is Weave a troll or is he hater, a hater? And I maintain the distinction. I say a troll's intention is to cause trouble, and they might say hateful things, but maybe they're being insincere. I think a hater is someone who's really trying to demean and diminish and hurt someone. And so he got involved, and he said Kathy's protests about feeling scared are just you know, absurd. She thought she could take on the trolls. She fought the law, laugh out loud culture, and the law won. And he was in prison for a hacking charge, <coughs> which I won't get into. Um, but when he came out with a new swastika prison tattoo, I'm like, OK, he's moving from the troll to the uh, hater category, in my mind at least. He also did something awful but fairly clever on Twitter this week. Did anyone see that? Just one or two people. On Twitter now, you can, you can uh, tweet and pay Twitter to make sure it reaches certain demographics. And they have really good demographic data. And so he posted a message that for a couple of pennies, he could post out his white supremacist tweets to prominent uh, African-American Twitter holders or tw twit out, uh, tweet out sexist things to feminists and stuff like that. So uh, that's still kind of trolly, but I actually do think he's quite the hater now. And there was actually a recent study that was really quite interesting that looked at personality attributes and commenters online just in 2014. And they, it was based on a survey, and they wanted to look at things like narcissism and sadism and a couple of other uh, dark tetrad personality attributes and see if there was any correlation between people's uh, posting frequency. And it turns out that there is a bit of a correlation between people who post a lot, people who troll, and these personality characteristics. And at the most pathological level, we have the example of Luca Rocco Magnota, which is one of those things, uh, whenever I read about this, because I knew I wanted to mention it in the book at least, I would need what's called a unicorn chaser. Does anyone know what a unicorn chaser is? Yes, yeah. we, we keep some handy, actually. This entire, uh, <laughs> uh, actually this in, in, entire system goes over to cute animals, but the unicorn <laughs> chaser is uh, the image to chase the image from your head that you've just seen that is so horrible that you need to do some brain scrubbing after the fact. Right, so as I was working on this book, I had my you know, supply of unicorn chasers. Um, and I have a really cute dog, too, that helps. Uh, but this person uh, had been posting videos on YouTube for a number of years, torturing and killing kittens. Uh, and eventually, he killed his lover and posted it online and ate the body. And he was found out, fled Canada. People didn't know where he was going. This whole time he was commenting online. He had lots of pseudonyms, teasing people, thanking his fans. And eventually he was found by the police in a German internet cafe, reading and posting comments about himself. So 
Hopefully, none of us will encounter people like this. But it's ve now very easy to do so online. And even if you have one you know, psycho uh, out of 100 <coughs> online, they can really have a disproportionate effect. So I think it's these two things. It's normal sort of everyday people acting out badly and some very scary people having a disproportionate effect that explains, in part, why we see such awfulness online. But the really important thing in the Sierra case and a lot of cases since that is that this notion of troll is sometimes not as useful as it might be. When trolls started out before the, before the web on the internet and Usenet, and, and flame wars happened, they were fairly innocuous. I mean, people might be really mean, but they weren't trying to ruin your life, to chase you out of your home, which is what happens now. And one of the things about the Sierra case that struck me was that when she was talking about, out about the harassment she was re, uh, receiving, people were like, well, don't confuse me with the haters. For instance, Chris Locke might say, yeah, I called you a hopeless dipshit, but I never said I hope you die. And I thought that was unfair to Sierra because she's in the middle of what I call a trollplex, right? This is this vortex of awfulness. Some people, notable people, are saying not nice things under their known names. They also have the trolls kind of weighing in on what's happening. You have the haters who really do want to hurt her and punish her. And then you have everyone else sort of kibitzing and weighing in. And the issue of free speech is coming up. And it's like, it has nothing to do with Congress and the First Amendment. This was just us asking questions of, is this what we want for our community? And is this be condoned or, or um, condemned? So I don't think the response to say, don't feed the trolls is appropriate anymore. I think the trolls of the 1990s still sort of exist. But we now really do have a culture of lulls, L-O-L-Z, where you have this whole uh, mix and vortex of awfulness coming from all kinds of quarters. But now I want to return back to that question of the ads and that cycle that I put up there a couple of minutes ago. And I want to ask that question of, can we trust the comments? The simple answer, no. <laughs> so there's lots of reasons why. We have corporate astroturfing. Samsung is most <coughs> famous for this. Uh, You'll find lots of people getting caught up and acting as a sock puppet. Right? I put a puppet on my hand, and it says, I agree with Joseph. He's really smart. A lot of people do that personally. They might be CEOs of companies or executives at a companies or employees of a companies or a government official. But I think Samsung had actually done this as a corporate PR policy. So this is not all that uncommon. We also have state propaganda. Uh, there was a US Air Force call for proposals where they said we were looking for software to help us manage multiple personas, sock puppets, so they could go on a foreign website and uh, do propaganda. And one person could leave time comments in favor of the United States. Hopefully, in the US, most of this stuff is happening outside of our borders, though you never really quite know, at least officially. China and Russia are well known as having thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that maintain the censorship uh, institutions and, and leave fake comments in support of Putin or whoever it might be. The people in Thailand who comment in favor of the monarchy are actually a uniformed uh, unit of the military. And uh, we didn't see much news of this, but in South Korea, uh, during their 2012 elections, there was a big crisis and controversy associated with people manipulating tweets in, in, during that election. What's 50 Cent Party? That's just the name of the Chinese uh, group of people who yeah. do this sort of the, thing. The idea was you got one renminbi for posting a comment, oh. the equivalent of 50 cents. So it was ah. the whole idea of having paid government paid commenters. Similarly, if you go back to that commercial space and you're thinking, oh, I'm reading a review of a product. Should I buy it online? If you look at the research, people are estimating about 10 to 30% of the commercial reviews on Yelp or Amazon or whatever it might be are fake. And people, research has been very clever about how they went about this estimate, which I can talk about more if people are interested. But it's really not that hard to find. So for instance, if you go on Craigslist, uh, the title, which is cut off here, says, looking for people to write Amazon reviews. Pay is $1 per review, but each review takes less than one minute. You could go into Craigslist right now, type review into the search box, and you would find ads like this. 
I give props to Amazon because <laughs> they've taken a lot of these pressures and brought it within their sort of system. And so on Amazon, there's something known as Vine reviews. Is anyone a Vine reviewer? I'm curious. It's something like if you are in the top 500 reviewers on Amazon, they will start sending you free products. And there was an obligation that you review 75, 80. It's changed over time, percent of the products you receive. And I think that's a good thing because actually when I ask people, do you know what a Vine review is, they don't. Um, and it means they got it for free. But at least if you do know, you are, as the FTC in the United States requires, at least disclosing the fact that this was a freebie or a subsidized product that you got to review. But you still end up with weirdnesses, like this person reviewing a book called System Identification, a Frequency Domain Approach. And the review says, if you're into math, you'll love this book. <laughs> That's it. So this is one of the sources of sort of the worst reviews on Amazon. I'm actually hoping to have my book get Vine reviews on Amazon. I think we've, we've, we've started the process, because I'm really curious what will happen. And the response to a lot of this is if we say, well, we really can't trust the reviews from anonymous strangers out there. What can we do in its stead? And companies have offered us a wonderful solution. They say the social graph will save us. And by this, they mean that instead of relying upon the reviews and comments of strangers, wouldn't you prefer to rely upon the recommendations of your friends? And this sounds like a great idea at first, but I think it too is, kind, is dangerous. And I think this is exemplified by this sponsored story. If you don't know, and I share a lot of the examples in the book, there's this really interesting culture on Amazon where there's farcical products or real products where people uh, go crazy in the reviews, writing f funny reviews. George Takei, Mr. Sulu, he, he's, quite, he's a top Amazon reviewer because he writes a lot of these farcical reviews. So for instance, we have a 55-gallon drum of sex lube. George Takei wrote a review of it in which he said it was great. And he sp sprays it on revelers in the gay, parade, pr uh, gay pride parade <laughs> in San Francisco. And this kid, Nick Burgess, thought this was funny, too. And he was on Amazon. And he said, yeah, I'll share this on Facebook for my friends to laugh at. And he said, a 55-gallon drum of lube on Amazon for Valentine's Day and for every day and for the rest of your life. Little did he know that his friends would start seeing his face appear in these ads on Facebook for this product on Amazon. And this happened to a lot of people on Amazon, actually. There was a class suit action against Amazon in which they paid out uh, millions of dollars to various people. And, they, and eventually, they stopped this particular <coughs> program, but they continue to do this sort of other thing. And Google Plus does this sort of thing. Uh, and Twitter, Twitter might be moving to this sort of thing. And so that's why I spoke about, when I talked about this graph, we're all looking for a place where we can be true to ourselves, we can be authentic, we can express ourselves without fear of being scammed and spammed and hit with the sludge. But eventually, we're pushed to move. And in fact, even if we lived in a world in which no one would ever hate on you, troll you, scam you, as those, say, Craigslist folks do, the platforms themselves, I think, will chase away their users. Reznor himself said a lot of the problems that the social networks are facing are because they just care about having the most people they can have. Clay Shirky has this rule of something like a, a comment system can be big, cheap, or uh, good. Pick two out of three. You can't have all of these things. But they do want all of these things. And the way that they try to get this is they have lots of people online, and then they sell access to you as a user of their platform. So Yelp has come under a great deal of attack for this, though they have so far won in the courts. So for example, uh, there were a number of reports of how you're a merchant, you're sitting in your restaurant, you get a call from Yelp, and they say, would you like to advertise with Yelp? You say, no, thank you. And they say, well, if you advertise with Yelp, we'd make sure a good review was prominently displayed on your page. And when people were on your competitors' pages, they'd see that ad for your place. And when people searched for that kind of restaurant, they would find you. And you still say, no, thank you. I'm doing very well. Next day, you have a horrible review on your Yelp page. 
written by a Yelp employee. People said this is extortion, this is blackmail. It went to the courts, the court said, and I can dig into this more if people want, but they said, no, it's not extortion. So this leads me to conclude that the social <laughs> graph is actually not going to save us, but make shills of us all. That's what I'm worried about. And so here we have another geek and poke uh, comic called Monetize Your Social Graph. Hi, this is my friend Steve. How much? Five bucks. In fact, there was a Burger King at, uh, app. Did anyone ever use that Burger King Facebook app? You would get, if you unfriended 10 of your friends on Facebook, you'd get a free Burger King burger. <laughs> And they got a lot of press out of it. Uh, they only had set so much money for the campaign. And when Facebook heard about it, they said, you're abusing our APIs. And they said, well, we don't care too much because we're approaching our budget for our campaign anyway. But still got them a lot of attention. <laughs> and I think that's where we're potentially headed. So to wrap this, out, wrap this up, I want to focus back on that question of these WTF moments. right? Just so many questions when you venture to the bottom of the web. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, does anyone know the story of this picture of this monkey? It's so interesting. I'm going to digress for a moment because it's such a fascinating question. This was a monkey that took a picture of itself. A guy left his camera out in the jungle, and a monkey came along, smiled, and took a picture of itself. Lots of people started spreading the picture online. Wikipedia hosted it. And the photographer said, you're violating my copyright. That's my picture. Wikipedia said, no. Monkeys don't have copyright in their pictures. And they actually prevailed. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find this picture on Wikipedia. OK, so some of the things that perplex me that prompt these WTF <coughs> moments at the bottom of the web, why the heck do people post first in the comments? Like, there's lots of weird things, TLDR, first, uh, WTF, but like, why? Here's an ad that went viral a couple of years ago. It's for a carbon monoxide detector. And a woman was on this Canadian houseware site, and she bought it, and she left a review, and she said, this thing saved my son's life, four out of five stars. <laughs> and people were like, what the heck? Right? And so again, I think there's really interesting reasons as to why this sort of happens. In particular, it has to do with shared expectations and commonalities of what we expect from rating systems, and do we overload rating systems. <laughs> Stupefying systems, in this comic, there's someone is saying, oh, I read something really <coughs> horrible happen. Like there was an earthquake or a hurricane. And the other person said, yeah, it's awful. I liked it immediately. So very often, we're overloading comments and rating systems with just too much information. I often see lots of people in Amazon reviews complaining about the fact that they ordered the product, but they mistakenly ordered the wrong product. I sent it back. I got the refund two out of five stars. And it's like, well, it's your fault that you ordered the wrong product. They did everything they could possibly do. Why are you giving the, the, the product two out of five stars? <laughs> or a lot of people are very pissed off when they get a Kindle version on their, of the book that is misformed because Kindle's translation system wasn't very good for a while. And they give the book one out of five stars. It's like, no, the book is really good. It's just Amazon messed up the Kindle. The other, my other favorite example of that is pain systems. You go to the doctor and they say, where is your pain? One out of 10. I'm like, I don't know. Does five mean in the middle? Or does it mean like failing, like I would do to my student? You got a 50%. Who knows? Oops. I think so much of what we see online is people making interesting but silly mistakes. So here we have the actor uh, who plays Dwight on The Office. He told his assistant, Joanne, tell Del Taco I will accept $12,000 to plug their shitty food. Thanks. Oops, right? You forgot to put the D in front of the twit, tweet. <laughs> we also have biases. There's a very famous uh, blog that says, I fucking love science. And she had lots of followers, though apparently a lot of people did not know that it was a woman that ran the blog. When she created a Twitter presence, she did have her picture profile. And dozens of people were like, oh my god, it's a babe. And so I think because of the shortness of tweets and the asynchronicity and a lot of the other attributes, we see this sort of behavior. And we also have excuses. I keep a running list of people that says, I was hacked. Uh, because there's dozens of cases of people saying they were hacked. We had the famous case of Anthony Weiner, who forgot to send, who forgot to prepend a D on his tweet when he took a crotch shot and sent it to a woman across the country. And where people were like, well, what's going on? He said, originally he said it had nothing to do with him. His account was hacked. People pressed him on it. 
He said, well, maybe it's a picture of me, but it was taken out of context. I don't know what appropriate context his crotch shot would have been in. Um, but he said, people get hacked all the time. It happens. And so like, what is going on? And I think if we go back to those original attributes of, of comment that I outlined at the start, I think it explains a lot of these phenomena. So comment is reactive. And so I think that leads a lot of people to post knee-jerk sort of responses. They're short, so they lend themselves to confusion. And they're asynchronous. And so often you'll see uh, more confusion and pile-ons. So I think, for instance, the fact that Justine Sacco was a pretty famous case where she tweeted something awful before she got on a plane going to Africa. It said something like, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Oh, wait, I'm white. I totally read that as she's ironically pointing out the privilege of herself. Other people thought that was horrible and racist. This storm started brewing on Twitter. And the fact that she was on her plane and disconnected, and that this storm was kind of rising and people started calling for her to get fired, uh, Twitter just blew up on this issue. And, and one of the hashtags was, has she landed yet? <laughs> and there's thousands and thousands of tweets. And people were like, someone has to get to the airport and take her picture so you can see her face when she turns on her phone. And somebody what? Somebody went to the airport because of the asynchronous nature of the communication. She was out of touch. And when she landed, she just saw hundreds of messages saying, you ho horrible, awful woman, and from her friends saying, oh my god, what happened, and from her employer saying, you're fired. But most importantly, I think a lot of this stuff that ha happens is because it's hypotextual. And by that, I mean naturally, comment in, in the web is naturally hypertextual. It's more than just text. It has links, right? You can connect from one thing to another thing. And that's the wonderful thing about the web. But I think it's hypotextual in that it is sometimes undertextual. So email responses, there's a reply header. Tweets often are in, con in the context of another tweet that you can find out, though often it's difficult. But the wonderful contextuality of all these comments and the fact that they circulate so promiscuously often means that those links are broken and we have all kinds of misunderstandings. Another case was uh, the NRA posted something after the morning of one of the many shootings, unfortunately, we've had in the United States. And they said, good morning, shooters. How is everyone? Uh -huh. And people were just like, how could you say that? And the NRA had to say the person who managed their social media account wasn't aware of the shooting that happened last night. And I think that's an example of the hypotextual uh, framing of so much comment that's out there. So we we've arrived at the end of our expedition, right? our journey to the bottom of the web. And what have we possibly learned? So how can we avoid the awfulness of the web? I don't think these are easy questions. All of them require a bit of work. But I think where the most useful ways of understanding comment platforms is by way of the metaphor of a garden. Tanahisi Coates, who was here a couple of years ago and talked about commenting systems, he likened a comment system as a garden. You just can't take an abandoned law out in the corner and call it a free speech libertarian paradise and expect wonderful things to, ha to happen. You have to spend resources and people and time and attention, maybe codes of conduct, and institute various norms such that you have a good comment platform and good comments emerge in your comment garden. What examples should and should not be followed? I don't think we should set up spaces where people are intentionally snarky, or at least when we do that, we, wouldn't we shouldn't be surprised when horrible things happen. I don't talk about feedback today, but I think a really nice example of a comment culture out there is what's called beta readers. In the fan fiction community, they give feedback and comment on one another's work. And beta reading, just like software development, a beta is something that's feature complete, but you put it out there because it probably has bugs. A beta reader is someone who reads something that is you know, written, but it's, it's rough, it's green. And they give you feedback. And they have actually a really strong culture and dozens of really useful guides about how to give feedback to one another. And what dangers are re revealed beneath the silt when you start pining, uh, panning the silt? I think there's a lot of manipulation out there. And so by reading the comments at the bottom of the web, I've come to the conclusion that comment is only as commentarable as we let it be. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your comments. <laughs> High five, or? <laughs> First post. First post. Okay. <laughs>
I, I wanted to get in the first post, and and uh, and I'm there, and I feel very good about it. I'm good about myself. Um, first, in passing, I, I just want to note, I, I do think some of these problems can be solved by more sensitive technology. It's fairly clear that if Facebook is able to do uh, facial recognition identification, Twitter should be able to sense that this is a dick pic and warn you that you should probably have a direct message in front of it rather than sending it off. I mean, this seems like something that we can simply solve with technology. More seriously, um, I'm curious, you seem to be talking about situations of comments in um, perhaps the, 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 the least likely to have um, sort of constructive conversation from them. So uh, at the best, reviews of books, Yelp reviews, at the worst, uh, comments that quickly descend into trolling and such. There are other people looking at comments with enormous aspiration associated with them. So for instance, we've seen in the news industry Newspapers trying to figure out is there a possible way that their comments can sort of serve as a, a forum for deliberation and debate of the issues that are sort of being brought up within them. Uh, and thus far, this seems to be extremely difficult to pull off. Is this a false hope? It is, is this a space in which it's possible for something like the Coral Project, which is now investing millions of dollars in trying to figure out could you solve newspaper commenting? Having taken this, this deep spelunking expedition to the bottom of the web, is that a hopeless task, or do they have the possibility of turning newspaper comments online into a worthwhile space? OK, so I'll talk about newspapers, and I'll also talk about better systems. So I'm going to begin with the better systems, because Facebook, uh, I had read that when they started their system of trying to report abuses, for instance, pornography, one of the things they found is once they added that button that says you can object to the thing that a person posted because it's obscene or something like that, they started getting deluged with people reporting things. And they'd go and look, and it was a Christmas picture. It was not obscene. And the reason they were getting all these photos reported as being obscene when they weren't was because people didn't like themselves in the photo. And they didn't have any other mechanism to say, I don't like myself in this picture, other than to say, this is obscene, take it down. <laughs> and so they had to get smarter about the system. And maybe you need to say, well, uh, we need to create a system whereby someone can say, I don't like myself in this picture. But does Facebook want to be in the middle of that? And so they architected it such that the message would go from the person who was in the picture to the person who posted the picture. And they would play with the, you know, the A-B test the ways that the communication could be facilitated to make sure something nicely happens. And it was a learning experience, and I think they have made progress. But this speaks to the fact that it is a learning progress. And if there's any sort of incentive in such a system for someone to sort of get around it or abuse it, it will happen. So it's a, uh, Judith Donoff has a really nice book about user interface design. She has a number of neat proposals she's worked with in her work here at MIT about how we could design better systems. And I think we should continue experimenting and playing with it. But I don't think there's necessarily an easy solution once you scale above the 150 or whatever the magic number is for the online context. In the news context, again, people have been experimenting. There's lots of different systems out there. The most popular system seems to be right now that you have a different off to the side commenting place where you allow people to talk. And you take the best comments and maybe you promote them to the front page under the newspaper article. That's nice in that it gives you some reflection on that particular posting, but it's not necessarily a robust conversation. Again, I think we have to apply what we've learned in terms of one of my favorite examples is Metafilter. I think they're a really good comment culture. And they do a couple of things. Uh, they started out trying to construct a good comment culture. They had human moderators. And they charged a $5 fee up front. And it's not where they make most of their money. In fact, they make most of their money from Google uh, AdSense. But just that $5 fee did a couple of things. One, it prevented people from doing drive-by comments. And <coughs> because they have to register and pay the money. And maybe it also caused a cognitive dissonance, which is I've paid $5 to belong to this community. Maybe I shouldn't be a jerk. I want to stay and hang around. So I think there's a lot of room for technological and psychological ex experimentation to create these spaces. But it's not an easy job. And I haven't seen anything yet that makes me think, oh, this is completely solved. And for instance, one of the things Ta-Nehisi Coates has said he said, it's, it, it, it's inimical to create in a community to see a post like on the New York Times that says, 
5,000 comments posted take part in the conversation. <laughs> it just isn't yeah. going to happen at that scale. And so I think if we want these sort of things to happen, and one of the reasons I think Reddit is successful is that it allows you to have very specific conversations and very specific subreddits. So it means that you have the same platform and technologies and larger cultural norms, but you can actually find a community that's very specific and that has a decent scale to it. And that's just the, you know, the, the social psychology of groups. So um, just before we go on to other questions, which we will in half a second, I just want to mention the Judith Donath book is called The Social Machine. It is another fine publication of the MIT Press, and you should run out and get both books immediately. Chris Peterson. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Chris Peterson, and I am a recovering troll. Um, but I want to uh, have you maybe uh, talk a little more about the dichotomy you had relatively early in the presentation about um, good versus bad people, kind of bad people acting out, and good people, I don't remember what the, what was the Acting thing? badly. Acting badly. And I'm wondering, with the good versus bad framing, like who's deciding <coughs> who's bad? Is it the people's who are doing the activity sense of themselves? Is it someone else judging whether they're good or bad, and um, who that person is, and what they're bringing to bear? Yeah. Because um, it seems like that, um, you talked a lot about how comments are, in some respects, and, and not just comments, but other forms of these tools are overloaded with a lot of these meanings. And I'm wondering if the good versus bad framing is carrying a lot of the discussion of like, and the decisions of what is good and what is bad in conflict in these spaces. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a very fuzzy sort of boundary. And I don't make the distinction as to say these people are clearly good and these people are clearly bad. Rather, I make the distinction to say that most of the research up to very recently assumed that these were good people acting badly under these computer-mediated circumstances. But I think we should now start tending to the fact that there are also people, maybe they're a fraction of a percent, who really are very dangerous people very disordered people, and they can have a disproportionate effect on what happens. And so I would never want to say, well, this person is good and this person is bad. Lindy West uh, is a comedian, I think. And a couple of weeks ago, she posted and gave a couple of great talks about how she met her, one of her fiercest trolls. And she had this amazing conversation. It was also on This American Life, a podcast. I really recommend uh, listening to it. And this guy, just to, you know, hurt her, her father had recently passed away. This guy created a Twitter account in her father's name and just would tweet these awful things that she'd see in her father's name and her, in her father's face. And it really the, affected the, the, her. The Twitter bio was um, father of two great kids and one idiot. Yeah. Um, and, and tweeting directly to her. And eventually, and so, her dead father's voice. Right, and so you say, well, is that guy good or is that guy bad? And I'm not trying to set up that distinction per se, because when she spoke to him, he said, I'm really sorry. That's probably one of the most awful things I've ever done. Uh, I was in a bad space. Uh, she's a heavy woman, and, she's, and he said, I was resentful of the fact that you seemed happy and successful and accepting of your body, and I just you know, spilled it all out on you. And so again, I'm not a psychologist, and I can't say exactly which one of those categories he would be in. It sounds like he's a good person acting badly. But I make that other distinction just to say that there are people who are very scary and damaging, and they can have a huge effect. Sarah? Um, I have a couple, lot of things I'm thinking about. One is that uh, my current book project is on gender-based attacks against women online. And you mentioned a couple stories here, and then you've got Weave with the swastika. And so I guess I'm thinking about trolling and both sending and receiving as not being evenly distributed across groups. And I just wondered <coughs> what you came across doing your work around that, around differences by gender, or race, that sort of thing. Yeah, so most, uh, to quote Whitney Phillips, who also has a new book out from MIT Press, uh, about trolls specifically, I quote her in my book saying that among the troll community she studies, it was a sausage fest, <laughs> to use her words. Uh, and so it is predominantly men, though not always. Uh, I was quite surprised to learn that in the UK they were talking about having a woman author be on the five pound note and to remove Darwin. And the people behind that campaign received a whole lot of vitriol. 
And actually, one of those trollers who were saying awful, horrible things was a woman. So it's not unusual, but very often it is men attacking women. And it's actually become enshrined as a type of culture. Like the type of hate speech you see is very, very formulaic. Um, so uh, would you like me to say anything more specific than it is mostly guys, though not completely? No, I guess I'm wondering, when you're looking at, you know, since you were at the, bo at the bottom, um, when you were looking at that stuff, did you personally notice patterns in the comments and in the, the things that you were looking at about the types of people targeted, the type, the nature of the comments, you know, whether they, you know, you're ma mentioning formulaic, you know, so are they comments about people's bodies or sexual behavior or those sorts mm -hmm. of things? When it's, so Susan Herring did some great work on trolling in the 1990s. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her work. And this was even before the contemporary, really nasty, hateful kind of stuff. And she was wondering, why is it that men flame and women thank? Those were the words that she used. And she thought that maybe men and women have different notions of politeness. And when she would ask them, do you think it's important to be polite online, both men and women equally said yes. But what she found is something she called like a free libertarian sort of philosophical axis, which is that the women she spoke to seemed more concerned about maintaining the face of the people they were talking about. And the men had this very libertarian free speech, can't let anyone censor you, you have to like fight back and slam and dominate the other sort of people. So she found that personality difference, and I think that's actually been enshrined in the internet culture at large. And I think we're now starting to step back from that to say, look, if you create a forum where you allow anything to go with this idea of libertarian free speech rules, awful things are going to manifest, unfortunately. Great. Let's uh, go to the bottom of the table there. Have you looked at any differences in cultures in different countries and things that work differently? Yeah, I've had that question a couple of times. I think it's a great question, but I haven't. So we can I, would, I would like to. I, it's, it's, it's an open question. Matt Carroll. Uh, Joe, uh, I was worked at the Boston Globe for a long time, and they had a, unwittingly did this comment experiment, really, where they had a free site and a behind the paywall site with the same stories on both sites. And on the free site, the comments would be a lot more comments, first of all, and they tended to be shorter, much more vitriolic, and they someone always ended up blaming Obama by the end of the comment stream. Whereas on the paid site, the comments were much more longer, much longer, much more thoughtful, and there seemed to be much more of a genuine conversation going on. And so that, I guess, is an example of where someone's paying some money, so they're, I guess, they think very differently about it. I'm just wondering what other uh, attributes or whatever make a good comment site besides just putting stuff behind a paywall. Why do people pay? Yeah, well, I think requiring some sort of hurdle to get in, be it pay or something else, I think having a particular leadership and culture started at the start where you say, these are the sort of things we want to encourage, and these are the sort of things we want to discourage. So when I studied Wikipedia, I thought the Wikipedia founders, Jimmy Wales in particular, did that well in that community. They had a couple of norms which became policy that said, this is the sort of space that we want to create. And it's not perfect, but I think that was important. And then there's the technology. Do you make it easy to moderate and manage the community? There's always room for improving upon that. And then there's also social mechanisms like moderation, meta-moderation. But my caveat with that is those things can always be gamed and abused. So there's like a whole panop uh, panoply, whatever that word would be. Panoply. 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 Thank you. <laughs> of, of techniques you have to do. And it's not, it's not easy. Uh, I teach a course on online communities. And we dig into all this stuff throughout the whole of the semester. Because there's no, uh, you, know, you stick it out there and you're ready to go. If you do that, bad things are probably going to happen. So, um, the platform that most interests me right now is one you didn't mention, and that's LinkedIn, um, which just seems bizarre <laughs> when it comes to, to this sort of thing. Um, I'm retired yet for the last two months. I've had people congratulating me on my work anniversary. I have to go back and look at my LinkedIn profile to see what it is they're congratulating me for. Yeah. I have people. Um, endorsing me for skills, which I'd like to imagine I have, but I know they have no objective way of actually knowing it's happened that. happened to me, too. Um, so, I, I mean, it just seems to have, I mean, it, it's positive, but it's almost, you know, so positive it's phony. I mean, has anybody actually looked at that? Because, I mean, this is also deeply tied to the social graph, you know, so it's supposed to be, you know, fixed by using the social graph. Instead, it seems to be this sort of, 
Right. I don't know if you've ever taught students who then go and they graduate and are on LinkedIn, but I get many, many messages every day <laughs> from all these students and their friends saying LinkedIn, connect, connect, connect. So I haven't studied LinkedIn specifically. I was interested, there's a chapter in there where I talk about what I call quantification, and I think a big part of this comment world is the fact that now everything is quantified and rated, right? So everyone gets stars. And beyond LinkedIn, there have actually been lots of websites that will, for instance, take your clout rating, and clout is a measure of your social influence. Do you have a Wikipedia bio? Uh, how many Twitter followers do you have? How many times you're retweeted? And they take this, all the social intelligence and give you a number. And there are sites out there that allow you to rate your colleagues and your peers and just this push towards quantification. In fact, at one point, there were sites that would set up dating among successful people. And you know, they'd had to be certain, they had to earn certain income and could only enter the dating pool if their clout number was a sufficient number. So I am concerned about the quantification of everything that happens <coughs> online and the rating and ranking of everything online, but I haven't looked at LinkedIn that much, though I agree that they're very promiscuous with sending you opportunities to connect. I'm always unsubscribing and I'm still getting the emails. Yeah. Please, Andrew. So this is a great uh, talk to be paired with our talk this evening, which is Hate Crimes in Cyberspace, hosted by Comparative Media Studies. It's going to be Danielle Keith Citron, who's okay. a lawyer. Yeah, great book. A professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And the unadvertised uh, Gamer Gate speaker. Is that here tonight? And that's tonight, 5 p.m., building 4, room 331. Oh. Yeah. And let's see, so the question I had was, I don't know if this is answerable, but with Gaiji's, the argument is that if you're invisible, if you're unaccountable, you will do selfish, bad things. But there are tons of people online, maybe the majority, who aren't trolls. Um, so how do you account for people if they're anonymous, if they're unaccountable, who still behave well, who want to build a you know, civil online community? Yeah, so there are both people who are identifiable and act horrible, and there are people who are unidentifiable or anonymous and don't act horrible. Uh, so for Plato then, one would have to say, well, there's a particular threshold. So maybe it's 20% of the people that would act horrible when given the power of invisibility. And I'm actually always very interested in threshold models. Like people have studied, when will a group of people who are protesting turn into a mob? And there are these very narrow margins where you could say you always have 20% of the people will always cooperate or be peaceful. 20% of the people are going to try to cause trouble. And the other 60% will kind of go with what they see happening around them. And so what I suspect is that in any particular community, you have that sort of threshold model. And if you happen to have one of those people who must always act poorly or antisocially, and other people start taking their cue, you can have a community go very bad very quickly, where a very similar community that just has very small difference on the margins could actually be much more robust and pro-social. So I think the question of why do some communities turn rotten so horribly, even though they seemed kind of similar at the start, relates to these uh, threshold models of collective behavior. We'll go here, and then you, you're next. I see you. Um, so you talked some about corporate and military sock puppeting. And I know I've seen on Tumblr, for instance, like sometimes uh, Tumblr users who are members of a minority group will get anonymous comments of like, well, I'm also a black woman, and I disagree with you. On occasion, those anonymous commenters will forget to click the send this anonymously, and it's like a white dude who's just saying, I'm a black woman, and I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any information or know of any research on that sort of, uh, like, so not from a corporate or military interest, but just general populace sock puppeting, and how often that's happening in I, I don't have any quantifiable numbers. I do know that has happened, and I talk a lot about the social justice wars in the various communities I study. And that is fairly common, and people are embarrassed when their real identities are released. But I don't have any figures on the particular numbers. One of the things I do talk about by way of historical analogy is uh, Galileo. And he's often thought to have been persecuted by the church for believing in a sun-centered universe. Uh, but in fact, he had had good relations with the pope. Got, very, got along very well with the church. And the pope actually said, well, I really want to hear about this book you write where you give both the heliocentric and the geocentric model of the universe a fair shake. And what he did is he created a sock puppet 
where he, cre he created a geocentric simpleton, actually named Simpleton, and had, had him mouth the literal words of the Pope. And that's what pissed the Pope off, which then called the hammer to fall down in Galileo. So people have been sock puppeting for a very long time, including for strategic purposes, where you don't necessarily sock puppet just to say, I agree with Joseph, but maybe you say, Joseph is an idiot. And among the paranoid people online, that's called a false flag operation, where you make something appear uh, that that's not really happened, that then you can have other people pile on and attack? Slightly more contemporary than the Galileo example. <laughs> there is some work that's been done um, looking at Qatari comment farms that have been um, responding to human rights complaints in Bahrain. So Bahrain had a particularly bloody crackdown on their corner of the Arab Spring and for two or three years there, if you have the temerity to say someone needs to hold Bahrain, a US ally responsible for human rights abuses, you would get just these torrents of, I'm a young female medical student in Bahrain. What do you know about my country? You know, you should shut up and, and talk about the problems in your own nation, um, which is a very effective way of actually getting someone to back off human rights critique, except for the fact that it's a comment farm, you know, three countries over you know, trying to figure out essentially how to manufacture a way to silence dissent within it. Um, so there's a little bit of work done on, on that and ways in which Twitter comment farms, uh, particularly around Russia right now, uh, are being used as a way of sort of countering dissent. Yeah, and in Russia they can be quite sophisticated. They can say, we want one of your personas to make a anti Putin argument, but we want the six other personas to make the argument against. Mm. Similarly, in the book, I show an example where most of the things you find on Craigslist are quite crude, will be, will write reviews for you. But one of the specifications, I need people to write reviews for me, and they were very specific. They were like, you have to use decent language, you have to post your posts in a over a long time, spread out, like don't send all your reviews at the same time. It has to be a mix between three and five stars. And so some people are quite sophisticated about uh, creating all this fakery out there. And you just can't assume that the fake reviews are the zero stars or the five stars. People are getting very sophisticated about it. You are. Hi. And thanks for your talk. <laughs> I, I noticed you mentioned two types of comment. comment. The first is uh, instrumental, like those in the Amazon and all that correctly. Is uh, and the second type is just commentary in the news articles. Uh, I wonder, do, do, how do you think the difference, or, or are they following the same sort of dynamics? Or do, do you, your theory apply to those two categories in the same way, or slightly different? Got, pe people write comments out of different motivations. Some people write on the Amazon, uh, just want other people to see, well, th this guy is great. He, he contributed to the whole community and tell each other what to buy. Right. I think you're right. People have different motives, and I think there are different effects. In the book, actually, each one of the chapters is divided up into how comments can inform, how comments can uh, help us, how comments can alienate us. Some of the things I didn't talk about today is how comments can shape us. So I talk more about am I ugly videos and other aspects of our interactions with online media and comments. Uh, so, and how comments befuddle us. So yeah, I think it's a good question. People have different motives and they have different effects and it's worth considering each one of those. Willa? Um, I, I really like the two main things that you pointed out at the end of how we can change this to, for the internet to suck less in general of, like, hey, cultivate a good community. And uh, as, as the social aspect and then the individual responsibility of approaching things as a beta reader, However, those things are really hard and they take a really long time. Um, and there's an awful lot of assumption of people taking personal accountability, which simply is not going to happen, at least for a long time. Um, and so I wonder if you've also come across any, uh, if you have logged anywhere communities that things have gone well. Like I hear a lot <coughs> about the uh, League of Legends or the, the online play and how they've dealt with the tribunal and all this other stuff in order to have people who have had a bad day or are notoriously bad people, um, how they deal with that by putting in place a justice system. Mm -hmm. um, have you logged other examples of systems which help people get to those, both the society base, the social base, and the individual accountability? So you're, you're right. I am making a diff difficult sort of uh, argument. Once I was talking about this book to someone, they're like, well, what's the easy tech solution? 
<laughs> and I referred to Donna's book, and I said, there's a lot of really good books, uh, ideas in there. But I'm a teacher because, and I have students in my classes on online communities and communication in the digital age, because I actually think education is an important part of what we need to do, and there's no easy fix. Similarly, when I talked about Wikipedia, I was like, there's no wiki dust that you can spread, and automatically your corporate communications are amazing, and you have all this amazing collaboration. Um, I think League of Legends is another really nice example. We spend a day on my online communities class talking about that particular system. And for those people that don't know, uh, they have a very mechanized system, very random, where you play people you don't necessarily know. And if you act poorly, people will sort of tag you and say that person acted poorly. You get enough of those, there's some sort of secret threshold, and then you go into the tribunal system where your peers are recruited, and typically these people don't know one another, and they make a decision and they can ban you or put a sanction upon you. So, I th that, so when I talk about systems that I think work well, I, I actually talk about League of Legends and I talk about Metafilter, but very often I talk about small scale communities, and Reddit as another big example because it allows them to go small scale. But most of the stuff that works out there, I think, managed because it works at the small scale. So the League of Legends, again, they have the small scale hack. They say, we're <coughs> going to take 16 of your peers, show them the evidence, and make a decision. Please. Uh, I was, I'm, my name is Ron Newman. I occasionally manage an online community, although not the one I'm, I'm going to bring up. You mentioned Reddit. Reddit seems like. I like Reddit. I like the little piece of Reddit I play around in. But my impression is that Reddit is a reservoir for some of the worst stuff on the web as well. Um, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, so there's awful stuff on Reddit, no doubt. There was lots of news when someone by the name of Violent Acres, who was called one of the worst trolls on the web, about the various subreddits he created about upskirt videos and down blouse videos and all this other sort of creepy stuff. Right, which feels like a world away from the little Boston Reddit that I was participating in. But. Right, exactly right. So it is this really big, amazing space. I can find lots of nice little communities in which to exist in. But if you create these platforms, you're correspondingly going to have bad spaces too, I think. Um, and then the community and the owners of Reddit have to say, this is stuff that we are no longer uh, want to see here. And again, I think Reddit started with this anarchistic free speech kind of ethos. And that was their concern at the start. But I think they got enough, enough heat that they said, we're actually going to crack down on this. With respect to Gamergate, a lot of the harassment and organization was happening at 4chan. And the guy behind 4chan was starting to get a lot of heat on this. And he cracked down on it. And they all went to 8chan. And so again, there's no easy solution. And we can kind of chase the haters and the misogynists around the web. Um, but hopefully we can chase them to places that people aren't going to randomly sort of stumble upon. That's my opinion. Fortunately, since they double every time, we can just preemptively block 32 chan, 16 more chan. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's actually, you know, their, their predictability is their very weakness. Um, do we have a final question for Joseph? Please, Liam. I wanted to, what, what is your definition of a comment? And like, oh. I, when you say it's a, you want to go to the bottom of the web, like, I guess I'm thinking there's also comments at the top of the web and on the side for annotations. And, and so I'm thinking about what the scope of that is, whether, uh, for instance, a tweet about an article is a comment, about, is a comment of that on that article, or is it only the stuff in the bottom of the page? Mm -hmm. And sort of you know, what's the scope of, of yeah. uh, it? So at the start, I noted how I think comment is reactive. So it's in response to something. It's short. It's asynchronous. And the reason I talk about the bottom of the web is because I think that speaks to the essence. It's the things in the margins. It's the things in the bottoms. It's the stuff we don't typically pay attention to and are counseled to avoid. That's what I wanted to look at. So um, I want to thank Joseph for, for being with us. And we'd have a round of applause for Professor Riedel.